Cool. Sam wants you if you qualify for military service. A critical recruiting crisis is underway that puts America's national security at risk. Unfortunately, a record number of young people are ineligible to serve. Others have no desire. Caitlin Burke explains why America needs to return to being a society of service. The U.S. Army is on track to have its worst recruiting year since Vietnam, a shortfall that could have implications for decades. This could potentially be multi-generational in terms of its impact. Young recruits today become our young and senior leaders of tomorrow. And so if you can't develop them today, you have a gap in leadership tomorrow. Right now, the Army has only reached about 52 percent of its recruiting goal for the current fiscal year, which ends later this month. Other military branches are closer to their targets, although attracting and retaining talent is a challenge across the board. We reduced our pilot shortage by 250 airmen, yet we still have over 1,600 pilot vacancies. Military leaders say many factors contribute to the shortage. The pandemic, the labor market, even competition from the private sector. The biggest problem, however, is a shrinking recruitment pool. Of the age-eligible population, less than a quarter are even qualified to serve. That has to do uh, with criminality, uh, can't necessarily pass the initial intake tests, uh, and or uh, mental health conditions, things like that, and obesity and physicality. I believe as a culture, we need to get back to a society of service. I think we need to look at natural national service. You don't have to be uh, in uniform to serve. You can be in inner city tutoring, national parks, rural medicine. But how do we get our, our youngest folks kind of, frankly, off the couch, you know, off the video games and out serving each other and learning those life skills of teamwork, discipline, followership? leadership. Florida Representative Mike Waltz believes stronger leadership is needed from the Pentagon, pointing to issues such as vaccine mandates. The National Guard is on the verge of potentially kicking out, of uh, discharging 20 to 25,000 National Guard's men and women who have concerns about the vaccine. And look, I get the notion of a soldier's given an order, they have to follow the order. But also as leaders, we have to constantly reevaluate our orders and, and do they still make sense? Colonel Matthew Amidon, director of Veterans and Military Families at the George W. Bush Institute, says all sectors working together are needed to solve this recruitment crisis. This is not just a Department of Defense challenge. This is a Veterans Affairs challenge. This is a community of philanthropy, a nonprofit, and a corporate sector challenge as well. Everybody needs a seat at the table because really at the core, what you are doing is by raising your right hand, maintaining and advancing our democracies. Congressman Waltz pointed out that the Biden administration's student debt relief program could be another blow to military recruiting efforts. One major reward for serving is a free education through the GI Bill. And Waltz says that's less of an incentive if the government is putting people through college. Gordon? Well, Caitlin, uh, your report mentioned the vaccine mandates. How else has COVID affected recruitment? Recruiters basically lost two years working in the school system when the pandemic shut everything down. And that face-to-face -face contact with young people there was important for recruiting. And in some places, COVID restrictions are still in effect on outsiders like military recruiters. And so they're still not really able to go into schools or even attend events. The job market also got a lot more competitive during the pandemic. So the private sector is recruiting quality workers just as heavily as the military is. And in an effort to tip the scales right now, the Army is actually offering bonuses of as much as $50,000 for a six-year commitment to certain high-demand positions. Gordon? How much has the Afghanistan withdrawal uh, also affected recruitment? Uh, I live in a military town. We have every one of the services, Air Force, Army, Marine Corps, Navy, Coast Guard. Uh, and there seems to be lingering dissatisfaction over it, particularly among those who spent multiple tours of duty in Afghanistan. And they're going, what was it for? At the end, the Taliban is back in charge. Is that having an impact? There's speculation that it is, you know, there's nothing solid that people can point to and lawmakers really are trying to get to the bottom of what's going on. There's some question that the perception of the military and its leadership took a hit because of the Afghan withdrawal and how it all went. Um, it also could have 
hurt retainment. You know, the all branches are really focusing on retaining people right now. During a recent military readiness hearing, uh, a top official in the Marines said that they're really struggling with recruiting, and so they are fully focused on retainment. And that seems to be a struggle as well, and, and that could have something to do with the Afghan withdrawal. All right. Well, Caitlin, thanks for the report. In other news, Hurricane Fiona is gaining strength. The Cat 3 storm is bearing down on a popular tourist destination in the Atlantic. Efren Graham has that story and more from the CBN newsroom. Efren? Gordon, the storm headed for Turks and Caicos Islands, a British territory with about 57,000 residents. It passed over the Dominican Republic Monday, destroying homes and leaving some communities without power. Thanks to the Lord that we were able to leave and the children weren't here. We give thanks to God that it was material items, no loss of life. In Puerto Rico, Fiona did widespread damage as up to 30 inches of rain caused massive flooding. Rescue crews pulled more than 1,000 people to safety. At least one person died in the storm. Most of the island is still without power and not expected to get it back for days. About two-thirds of the people are without water. President Biden pledged FEMA support and said 300 federal workers are already there helping with response and recovery. Congress is considering reforms to process to the process of certifying presidential elections. The bill is a response to January 6th and efforts by some lawmakers to challenge electoral votes in the 2024 election. It centers on overhauling the Electoral Count Act by clearly defining the vice president's role as simply ministerial. It also raises the number of lawmakers needed to object to elections to one-third both the House and the Senate. The House is expected to vote on the bill this week. God and politics, that's the theme of the next film in the God's Not Dead franchise. Wendy Griffith was in L.A. for the red carpet announcement. If you were a fan of the God's Not Dead series, good news. A fifth movie, God's Not Dead, Rise Up, is slated for 2023. Several stars from the popular franchise, including David White, Dean Cain, Isaiah Washington, and Corey Oliver, hit the red carpet in L.A. for the big announcement. We are going to make another God's Not Dead. <laughs> Producer and actor David White says the fifth installment asked the question, is God dead in politics? And I think that's a question that all of us um, are asking. And uh, in this movie, we'll tackle a lot of those, tackles a lot of stuff in it. And, and I think um, I've, always been, I've always been amazed to see how the God's Not Dead movies, when they hit, it's at a very relevant time. You know, every time before one of these movies, uh, we pray about what it is that the Lord wants us to do with it. Where is it supposed to go? Corey Oliver, who starred in the first movie, is excited about returning for number five. I just said yes. I didn't even ask what's the role. I mean, I, you know, they mean it, but right. I, and I think it's just because the first Buzz Not Dead changed my life in so many ways. I've always been a believer and I've always loved the Lord, but I was, I was, um, it was just a rough time in my life. And then, you know, God in his infinite way shows up and shows off in a way that you can't imagine. And you get to play the leading role between Hercules and Superman, you know? Oh my gosh. And so I'm, it wasn't about me, it was about God and what he could do. Actor Dean Kane of Superman fame is back. And so is his bad boy character. Actually, I'm really excited to see what my character is, uh, has been up to. He, he was up to no good in the first one, for sure. In fact, I think he's the only character who had no redeeming qualities about him whatsoever. So it will be interesting to see where he goes from here. Isaiah Washington will also resume his role as Congressman Daryl Smith. Yeah, he's from Texas, conservative. Um, he's bringing that energy back. How does it feel to be a part of this franchise and, and now to see it growing even more? It, it, it feels just as exciting as it felt with me working with Spike Lee. He's been doing the hype in the, the middle of his career. Uh, it's always exciting to work with innovators. And if you want to catch up on the franchise, all four God's Not Dead movies are streaming on Pure Flix. Wendy Griffith, CBN News, Los Angeles. Hard to believe we reached number five. Gordon? All right. Well, it's time for God to get back into Washington. That would be wonderful. I think we can all uh, appreciate that. Uh, I know uh, the Senate chaplain is definitely praying for it.
The long arm of cancel culture is reaching beyond conservatives. Harvard Law Professor Alan Dershowitz has felt the full force. He paid a high price for defending former President Trump and for calling out the political left. Gary Lane spoke with him about the consequences of choosing principle over partisanship. Alan Dershowitz is known as a defender of notorious newsmakers, including O.J. Simpson and Jeffrey Epstein. But it's another client that caused prominent liberals, friends, and even some family members to reject him. The noted lawyer's defense of Donald Trump during impeachment. The Constitution provides only four grounds for impeachment, treason, bribery, or other high crimes and misdemeanors. They didn't charge him with that. Uh, they didn't charge him with any kind of criminal type or like behavior. They charged him with abuse of power and obstruction of Congress that are unconstitutional. So, of course, I would uh, defend him. And for that, Dershowitz says he's paid a high price. He details the experience in his latest book, his 50th, The Price of Principle, Why Integrity is Worth the Consequences. Dershowitz writes that today in America, partisan advocacy masquerades as principled argument. He contends hypocrisy and a far-left agenda elevate identity over principle. Once accepted by his community, the former Harvard Law professor isn't getting invitations to return to venues like New York's Temple Emanuel and the 92nd Street Y. Dershowitz says even the public library has banned his books, and he's no longer welcome at most social gatherings. It's been both personal uh, and institutional, personal. I was seated next to Caroline Kennedy, the daughter of the former president, at a dinner party, and she said, if I knew you had been invited, I wouldn't have come. This is the ambassador to Australia who's supposed to be able to be in the same room with uh, uh, leaders of foreign countries who won't be in the same room with a man who showed a profile and courage, uh, to paraphrase her father's uh, a book. Friends and acquaintances have also rejected his family members. My wife worked out in a gym and somebody walked in and said, oh, that's Alan Dershowitz's wife. We can't be in the same room with that person. Larry David came over to me while I was trying to have lunch and start screaming at me and yelling, you're disgusting, you're disgusting, because I patted Mike Pompeo on the back. He's my former student, congratulating him for the, cramp day, for, for the um, Abraham Accords. He says several lawyers have shared they won't defend President Trump because they don't want to be dershowitz They don't want to be treated like him. Despite the rejection, Dershowitz still defends Donald Trump when warranted. Although he believes the feds have the evidence to indict Trump for possessing classified U.S. government documents, he predicts the former president will not be indicted. How about the FBI's recent raid on uh, Trump's Mar-a-Lago home and the search for and seizure of classified documents, was that justified, legal in your opinion? It was not. Uh, they should have persisted on their subpoena. They could have enforced the subpoena in court uh, and made uh, President Trump turn over the 15 or so boxes. But instead, they decided to engage in a very widespread search, which also uh, involved the seizure of, of not only classified material, but lawyer-client privilege material, executive privilege material, and probably declassified material. And Dershowitz says that means Justice Department lawyers are now examining Trump's private information. Imagine what would happen if one of the Justice Department lawyers on the Taint team read a email that said lawyer-client privilege, absolutely privileged, confidential, but it had some really juicy stuff about Trump that would destroy his chance of ever winning the presidency again. Do you think that wouldn't get leaked? Does anybody in the world believe that that would remain confidential? Although Dershowitz believes Trump's rights have been repeatedly violated, that won't lead him to vote for Trump if he gains the Republican nomination for president in 2024. Instead, Dershowitz would vote for Joe Biden again. I was a strong supporter of Biden because I thought he could help unite the country. He's a compromiser by nature. Um, it hasn't happened. I've been a little disappointed. I'm still going to vote for him again if he runs and is healthy. Um, but nonetheless, I'm disappointed that he hasn't done a better job in uniting the country. And that disappointment leads to a deep concern whether America can overcome its bitter partisan divide and return to national unity. This is perhaps the worst that I've ever seen. And um, the danger is the hard left is so intolerant and so totalitarian in its mindset. And they're the teachers of our future leaders. And so I worry much more about the totalitarian mindset of the hard left 
than I do about the totalitarian, totalitarian mindset of the hard right. Uh, we've been through this before during the McCarthy period, during the anti-Vietnam period, and we've gotten back. For Alan Dershowitz, it may take more critical thinkers, people of integrity, and Americans choosing principle over partisanship. Gary Lane, CBN News. It actually means we need to return to what's called liberal principles and a liberal education. And that means you're open to all points of view. You respect people's opinion. You allow them to express their opinion. And then in the marketplace of ideas, you allow the best ideas to surface. That is the whole point of free speech. That's the whole point of freedom of assembly. But we're seeing a culture now that is radically polarized on both sides. When you look at what's happened to Alan Dershowitz, uh, it's um, oddly similar to the struggle sessions uh, of China, where people would um, be struggled against and shunned and then uh, paraded into the street and uh, re-education through force, like all of these bizarre things that happen uh, when you uh, embrace an ideology so much that anyone that isn't part of your ideology is now suddenly an enemy of the state. We have seen a sitting president condemn an entire, I mean, half the nation just because of how they voted. Now, on the right, I mean, who wants to go back to the McCarthy hearings and, you know, are you a fellow, fellow traveler, all of those kinds of things? Who wants to go back to some kind of disorder where if you don't agree with a particular election result, uh, you try to overthrow it? This isn't unique to just Trump supporters. Uh, it, you just have to go back six years. Who's the first one to ever say that my election got stolen? Well, it was Hillary Clinton that said that uh, and said it in 2016. Let us please stop this. Uh, let's come together and say well, elections really do matter. Uh, and let's abide by them. Let's respect them. Uh, let's respect the other side. If they have an opinion different from ours, okay. Um, let's try to find some kind of middle ground because that's ultimately how you govern a country. Again, it's a return to liberal principles where you have freedom of speech and freedom of assembly and you're not being judged by how you vote or what political persuasion you are. You're being judged that you're an American citizen and you have the same rights uh, that we all need to cherish. Well, Alan Dershowitz's book is called The Price of Principle, and it's available nationwide. Police Captain Pam Coates spent her career stopping bad guys. To cope with the pressure, she became a shopping addict. Over the years, her bills added up, and as she got closer to retirement, Pam feared she'd never get out of debt. Retired Police Captain Pam Coates dedicated her life to public safety by serving 27 years in Nevada law enforcement. This single mother of two served most of her career investigating sexual assault and child abuse crimes. I ran into a child victim that I had removed from a very bad situation. She was in a safe house and she came up and gave me a hug. That made it all worthwhile. In 2010, Pam's mom suffered a stroke, so she took over as her live-in caretaker. So I was home a lot to alleviate, I don't know, the boredom. I started shopping online. I was a shopping addict. That was my go-to when I was feeling down, when I was unhappy with the circumstances I found myself in, not being able to have much of a social life. That was my social life. My sister from California would come over and give me a reprieve from taking care of my mother. And my youngest daughter and I would typically go on little vacations. My mom would help out with paying for the travel expenses, but I would continue to shop even when I was on vacation and buy extravagant things for my daughter. And so those credit cards continued to maintain a pretty high balance. And then I started using my credit cards to help offset some of my bills. So that adds up. She was promoted to lieutenant with an increase in pay. Pam dialed back her spending to buy a home. Then when I realized that, okay, I could afford the home and the mortgage payments, then I continued with my spending. It was at least 40% of my 
my check was going towards my credit cards. I was just barely scratching the service, just paying the, the interest. And I never, never prayed to God to ask for help because I didn't think I had a problem. Around that time, Pam rededicated her life to Christ and started going back to church. She gave what little she had left in the offering. I felt like I was letting God down by not tithing because I was now making a very good income. And I was consumed with guilt that I could not tithe, but yet I could not stop spending. Five years later, as she neared retirement, Pam calculated a budget based on her pension income versus her expenses. $20,000 in credit card debt left no margin in her budget. I had a long conversation with God, and I said, God, I think this might be my chance to be able to tithe like I've wanted to do, like I know I needed to do. Please forgive me for my selfishness because I was so selfish all those years to buy things for me that I did not need when I could have been helping so, so many other people in need. When Pam retired in August 2020, she paid off all her credit card debt with her deferred comp time fund. She started tithing as her first budget priority. And he works miracles. He does. I never thought I would be out of debt, ever. I thought this would be something I would carry to my grave. Now credit debt free and spending within her budget, Pam discovered even more ways to give to God's work. She found the 700 Club during the pandemic and joined as a Thousand Club partner. I love the stories of seeing people turn their lives from a life of crime to knowing Christ and making a difference and contributing to society. When I found out what CBN is all about, they help people all over the world. I said, oh my gosh, I want to help them. I'm so blessed with having clean drinking water that we take for granted. I want to help someone that doesn't have clean drinking water. And so that's when I started giving regularly to CBN. I couldn't think of a better organization to give to. I just feel if you give and help the poor that God will in turn richly bless you. That's what God wants us to do. He wants us to reach out and help others. I feel that's our purpose. Pam has it right, that's our purpose. Uh, I was raised with the concept, the purpose of money is to help other people. And when you do that, here's a wonderful blessing you walk into. It's from Proverbs chapter 19. If you help the poor, and that's a big one, if you help the poor, you are lending to the Lord and he will repay you. Pam finally got it. Here she is working and, and spending, spending above her means, uh, not living within her income. She's accumulating a mountain of debt, and then she gets the idea, well, this isn't the way out. The way out is to live in accordance with what God tells you to do, and that will bring you deep satisfaction, something that um, binge buying isn't going to do. It will absolutely satisfy you. Uh, when you lend to the poor, if you help them, you're lending to the Lord and he will repay you. If you give, then he gives back. If you like a start a lifestyle of this, this is not some get rich quick scheme. This is a, I want to commit. I want to live my life in accordance with God's commandments. And one of them is you tithe, give, and it will be given unto you. With the measure you use, it gets measured back to you. If you'd like to start doing that, give us a call and say, yes, I want to join the 700 Club. I want to be a part of preaching the gospel around the world. Portion of every gift you give goes into the work of CBN International to do just that, where we train Christians how to preach the gospel in their own language, how to have testimonies of what Jesus is doing, how he's answering prayer right in their own country. You're a part of that when you join with us. If you want to see people fed right here in America, join the 700 Club. A portion of every gift goes into work of Operation Blessing. You're helping people right here at home and around the world. You're helping our disaster recovery teams. You're helping all the special surgeries, the water program, but especially that feeding program. You're a part of all of it when you join. Now, how much is it? It's just $20 a month, that's 65 cents a day. If you want to join at a higher level, there's 700 Club Gold for you at $40 a month. 1,000 Club is $1,000 a year, that breaks out to $84. 
a month. And our way of saying thank you for joining the 700 Club is to send you a copy of our latest teaching on Psalm 23. Now, if you join at 700 Club, we'll send you one copy. If you join at 700 Club Gold, we'll send you three copies. If you join at 1000 Club, we'll send you five copies so you can share this teaching with your friends and your family. It's a teaching based on one of the most famous passages in the entire Bible, and it's called, The Lord is My Shepherd. I want to do a meditation on the Psalm of David, Psalm 23. Gordon Robertson presents, The Lord is My Shepherd, a Psalm of David. Each verse is a guide for us in our life. And it's a beautiful illustration for me of how Jesus leads us. What happens when we fully embrace the Lord is my shepherd? Get the Lord is my shepherd, the latest audio teaching from Gordon Robertson. Call now or go to CBN.com. Well, when you join the 700 Club, you are, as Pam said just a moment ago, helping people around the world in some of the most remote locations on the planet. High up in the mountains of Peru, farmers in one village now have a source of clean water, and it's all because of you. Abraham and his mom, Isabel, live in the mountains of Peru, more than 13,000 feet above sea level. Abraham is a big help to his mom. I help collect water. I help care for the sheep, the cows, and the donkey. The greatest need for Abraham and others in the community has been clean water. For generations, they've gotten water from two sources, a pond, which collects runoff during rainy season, and an open pit shallow well, which is more contaminated than the pond. The water has lots of insects and is very dirty. Even the cows and the sheep get sick from drinking it. Collecting water has been a challenge, too. We have to carry large buckets on our backs. They're really heavy. It takes us three hours to get water every time we go to collect it. Abraham said he regularly got sick from drinking bad water. Sometimes I got a headache, fever, diarrhea, and stomach aches. I will get sick for a whole week. I felt bad because then mom has to do all the work then Operation Blessing came to the community with a plan. First, we dug a new well with concrete walls. Then we added pipes and a storage tank with chlorine to purify the water. Finally, we ran pipes from the tank to homes in the community, including Abraham's. I was happy when I saw that water project. I knew we would be able to fill the animals' trough and that I will have water to take a shower. Abraham said he was also excited to drink the water without getting sick. The water is very clean and cold to drink. Thank you, Operation Blessing, for bringing that water to our house. Thank you, 700 Club members, because you made that happen. You know, not just having to make that three-hour trek every day so that they could drink water, but also for their animals, imagine that, and then gone and you're right back the next day and again and again and again, but not anymore because you've made a difference. We just want to say thank you. Joining the 700 Club is all about that, making a difference in places of need in people's lives, a difference that changes their lives. We want to invite you to do that if you haven't done it already. Our number's toll free. It's 1-800-700-7000. You just call and say, I want to join the 700 Club. We're happy to sign you up, and there are lots of options for doing that. A general membership, let me show you, is there on the top line. That's $20 or more a month. It's 65 cents a day that that works out to. If you're already a 700 Club member, would you today consider going up to 700 Club Gold? That's a gift of $40 or more a month. Or go up to the 1000 Club at $84 a month. Become a 2500 Club member. That's $209 a month. Or a founder at $5,000 a year, which works out to $417 a month. You can make a difference without ever leaving the comfort of your own home. But you can change lives like you just saw in that story. What a privilege we have to be able to do that. And when you do, we want to say thank you for your kindness, for your compassion for other people by sending you Gordon's teaching, The Lord is My Shepherd. 
Such a rich psalm, and we think this teaching will really expand your understanding of everything that is involved in that psalm, everything that's in it deeply for you as a Christian. We want you to have this. It's our gift to you when you call right now, and we'll get it out to you as soon as you call. Gordon? Kathleen lost her teaching job after her school closed permanently during the pandemic. That's when this single mother was forced to make a choice, spend what little money she had on gas or use it to buy food. Well, today, Kathleen no longer has to make that choice, thanks to you. Kathleen is a single mother with a passion to serve the families in her community. But not long ago, she needed help herself. I was working full time as a teacher in a small school, small Christian school, and I felt that's exactly where God wanted me. So when COVID hit, my job stopped and they closed down permanently. It hurt to lose my job. This one day I was trying to decide between using the money for gas or to buy bread so we can make sandwiches. But there were moments like that that made it really hard. Faced with a need for food, Kathleen and her daughter Carolyn discovered Rescue Community Food Pantry, a partner of Operation Blessing. I was so blessed because I could see these were things that I could use. This was really gonna fill some of the gaps See, God had a way that he was going to provide that I had to be willing to step out and accept. After Kathleen and her daughter came to the food pantry together, they began attending Rescue Church and giving back. So we started cleaning the church together on Saturdays. I went with her and we started getting involved. The food pantry and the cleaning gave me time with Carolyn we had never had before. And serving the Lord together, it's like, who gets to do that? Now Kathleen works as a preschool teacher at the church. She's also the volunteer coordinator at the food pantry, thanks to the support of Operation Blessing Partner. Families like Kathleen's are receiving the help they need. Kathleen and her family are thriving and hopeful for the future. I just want to thank those at Operation Blessing who made it possible for me to receive food. Operation Blessing has helped so many people that have come through our food pantry, I see why now. From where I was to where I am now in ministry, it wouldn't have happened any other way. That's what we love to do. It's not a hand out, it's a hand up to let people know there's a hope, there's a future for you. What a great joy or privilege it is to help people in their time of need, and you can be a part of it. All you have to do is join the 700 Club. Portion of every gift goes into the work of Operation Blessing, and we're shipping millions of pounds of food to food banks across the nation. Kathleen's story is just one of many of people that you're helping during the pandemic, during our times of trouble. We want to be there for them, let them know that we care, and we can help them put food on their table. If you want to join with us, call us now, 1-800-700-7000. Just say, yes, you can count on me. Me, Here's my gift. How much is it to join the 700 Club? It's $20 a month. We have other levels, 700 Club Gold at $40 a month. 1,000 Club is $1,000 a year. That's $84 a month. When you call, make sure you ask for Pledge Express. That's electronic monthly giving. Bank doing all the work, and we send as our gift to you monthly teaching CDs or downloads. You can stream them through the CBN Family app. Uh, your choice. Uh, you can, uh, a lot of different ways you can sign up for Pledge Express. You can call us, 1 800 700 7000. Say, I want to join Pledge Express. You can go to CBN.com and you give monthly on the internet. You'll automatically sign up for Pledge Express. And then we have a new text to give where you can text the letter CBN to 71777. A link will show up on your smartphone. You click on that and you can go to a monthly giving page. Again, automatically signing up for Pledge Express. Now, as a special gift, the CD, The Lord is My Shepherd. It's an in-depth look at, the, at Psalm 23. It's a passage of scripture that many of us know by heart. And then in that, you'll, find, you'll discover the full meaning of each verse. Welcome back to the 700 Club for this CBN Newsbreak. 
A new record highlights the crisis on the U.S. southern border. Officials have recorded more than 2 million encounters with migrants so far this fiscal year. That's more than ever. Reportedly, a growing number of the migrants are coming from leftist regimes like Venezuela, Nicaragua, and Cuba, fleeing economic devastation and political repression. The crisis now creating internal conflicts as border states are sending migrants north to sanctuary cities. Turning overseas to Iran, there are reports in the streets of several cities after a woman protest rather in the streets of several cities after a woman died in police custody. Masha Amini, a 22-year-old, fell into a coma and died following her arrest in Tehran last week by the morality police. They took her into custody for improperly wearing a hijab, the Islamic head covering women are required to wear in public. Videos on social media showed demonstrations in the capital, Tehran, and it is spreading to other cities as well. Protesters chanting, death to the dictator. At least five people were killed on Monday when security forces opened fire during the unrest. I want to remind you, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website. It's CBNNews.com. Tony Askew thought he had the perfect life. He had the cash, the cars, the clothes, and the women. Tony also had a team of federal agents waiting for a chance to take him down. As a kid, if your father tells you you're going to come spend time with you, that's like the most exciting thing to you. So I remember just waiting outside. My mother telling me, come on in to eat, son. I said, no, nah, Mama, Dad said he's going to come and pick me up. He never came. He lied to me. So, like, you know, as, as a kid, that kind of kind of hurt. For Tony Askew, the pain of that rejection grew into anger. I couldn't deal with nobody saying nothing to me. I would get conduct notices almost every day for fighting in school, even at the lunchroom table. Kids say something to me, I jumped over the table to fight. And that, that's how I dealt with my, you know, my emotion. Tony's hardworking mom tried to steer him the right way by making sure he was in church, but he couldn't grasp the idea of a loving God. I didn't know nothing about God. I just thought that the people in church was faking and running around with their hands up. I didn't know that he, he loved me and cared for me no matter what, you know, wanted me to come closer to him, wanted me to be a part of his life. Despite his mom's efforts, Tony would enter a life of crime. At 10, he was stealing candy to sell at school. Later, he stole from stores and homes. I had no conscience as far as stealing. I, I did it like, it like it was just a natural thing to do. I always thought I would be able to outsmart, you know, the authorities. Then after graduating from high school, Tony started selling drugs. Soon, he was living the party lifestyle of a successful drug dealer. It made me feel powerful. Um, uh, went to Cancun, you know, at 19 with your own. We had our own apartment at 19, own cars, um, partying girls. Uh, I just, I felt powerful. Dealing drugs was a dangerous world, but over the next decade, Tony would make millions. He enjoyed a lavish life filled with nice homes, cars, and world travel. He gave little thought to anyone but himself. I felt important. Uh, I felt um, like Superman. I felt on top of the world, I felt that, you know, anything I could do, I can do. Nobody can tell me I can't do nothing. I was cocky and arrogant. And I remember this female asked me, how did I feel? And I said, perfect. I said, perfect. I really felt that way, you know, at that time. But as more years passed, Tony grew paranoid about getting caught and decided he wanted out. About the same time, his girlfriend, Natasia, became pregnant. Tony wanted to be there for his child since his own dad wasn't there for him. He was really um, into family and I picked up on that a lot. And he often even talked about, you know, like what it would be like whenever he had a child. I really, really loved that about him. The problem was he felt trapped by the high cost of his lifestyle. I didn't want to be selling drugs, to be honest with you. Like, I sold drugs just for the money. I knew it wasn't right, but I had to do it. I had to keep doing it. Tony didn't have to wait long for an out. Another dealer squealed on him to federal agents, and Tony was arrested in 2005 for drug trafficking. Now desperate, he wondered if God could help him. God had to be tugging at my heart. 
in my spirit. Something was happening in me like, grab that Bible, open that Bible up. That's the only person that's going to help you right now. You can't get yourself out of this. You need a greater power to get you out of this. Tony asked to go to the Christian block of the jail, where he read God's word and came to a life-changing decision. The presence of God was on me so strong, it, it, it changed me. I had that peace that surpassed all understanding came over me. And, and I looked at life differently. I said, Lord, you real. I gave my life to Christ. I, I know that Jesus died for my sin. I wouldn't think that God would, would, would forgive a person like me, you know, but he did. He loved me that much. That's when I start thinking about the people that I, you know, that I hurt, you know, um, even from the people who bought drugs from me, a whole new gate had opened up for me of caring about people and caring about people's feelings. And I have a conscience now. Tony was convicted and would spend the next nine years in prison. During that time, he grew in his faith and started to heal from the hurt of his dad's rejection all those years earlier. I forgave him for not being there for me when I was a little kid. God repaired that hurt from my youth. You know, he transformed my mind, renewed my mind. Through all those years, Natasia and their son Princeton waited for Tony. After working through many issues, the couple married in 2018. When he came home, there was no partying or anything like that. He's always home, wanting to be involved with the family. He definitely became more humble. He was able to talk about, you know, not just how things benefit him, but how they benefit other people. Tony started his own trucking company and works hard to provide for his family. His main goal is clearer than ever. I want to make God proud. I, when I go before him, I want him to say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Also, showing love. That's a real man, showing love, um, showing compassion, showing empathy for others, something that I never had before. Letting people know that it's Christ that changed me, and, and, and that's why I'm who I am today. It's a funny thing, isn't it, how something can happen to us when we're young. Something like a dad not being there, a mom not being there, that's not a small thing. But I mean, it can change us. You know, suddenly we feel less valuable. We feel less than in every area of our lives. And so being powerful somehow gives us back a sense of control in an out-of-control world. And boy, that'll take us down the wrong path, won't it? That's the ploy of the enemy. It's to do everything he can to pull us away from God, to pull us away from an understanding of how much God loves us. For Tony, that was a long path that he went down. You know, God will let us go down some long paths if the long path brings us back to him. I don't think Tony would have picked up a Bible in the world where he had found power and where he felt he was in charge of everything. But alone in a jail cell with the Word of God comes the understanding that, you know what? I'm not doing such a great job of my life. I'm not really pulling this off the way I want to. I'm not really in charge. And then we begin to read about God's love, about his mercy, about his grace. And like Tony, we say, maybe I need, maybe I need God. But you know, there's something that comes along with that realization. God isn't just someone to be used to fill up the broken places in us or the empty holes in us. God wants a relationship. And with that relationship comes an understanding that he is God. He is the creator of all of this, the creator of each and every one of us, intentionally created. And so when we come into a relationship with him, it's not, hey, God, join my party. God's saying to us, no, but you're invited to join me. It means, though, that you have to let go of everything that you've tried to fill your empty with, emptiness with and come to me with your arms wide open. Come to me surrendered. You see, that's why we sing songs like, I surrender all. It's what we talk about in the Christian life. It means letting go of you so you can take hold of him 
And in that process, all that emptiness inside gets filled up. It's the great exchange. It's the redemption. God redeems what was taken away from us, and he makes us whole. And he does all of that in relationship with him. But listen, if today you're watching Tony's story and you're intrigued by what was done for him, understand Tony had to come to a place of saying, enough of me, God, I want you. A place of saying, I've made some bad choices in my life and I'm going to walk away from this. I'm going to grab hold of a new way of thinking, a new way of behaving, and in the process of that, Tony begins to care about other people. It's amazing. It's a miracle what God does inside of us when we give ourselves to him. Would you like to do that today? So simple. So simple. Just pray with me right now. Jesus, I am a sinner. Will you forgive me? I want to start over a new beginning. I want you and I don't understand why you want me, but I'm saying, okay, here I am. Everything that I am, all that I have, I give it to you. Teach me how to live for you. Change my heart, my mind, my way of life. Make me whole. Heal me, God. Fill me up so that I'm so full of you that there's no room for me to do anything apart from what's right. Teach me your ways, God. If you've just prayed that prayer, you've had a great new beginning. We want to help you grow in your life with Christ. What do you do? You said a prayer. You mean it in your heart. How do you live for him? This new day packet will help give you wise counsel, and it's free. Call our toll-free number. Just say, I'd like the new day packet. We'll get it out to you. We want to leave you with some wise words from Psalm 119. It's a great psalm. This is verse 105. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Get into the word of God. It'll change your life. God bless you. We'll see you tomorrow.